On this episode of All About Fitness today, it is an honor and a privilege to be speaking with Dr. Mike Simpson. Doc Mike, how are you doing today? Good, brother. Thanks for having me on. Well, thank you. And, and this is one of those things of where it's always fascinating to talk with some of your background. And we'll, we'll go into that, what that is a little bit more, but, but you've been through special operations training. And the question I always have when, when I speak with somebody who's been through, through that is what's more, is it more difficult on the physical side or more difficult on the, the mental, emotional side? Because I think it's just a fascinating experience of what people go through in that type of training program. Yeah, it's, you know, the, the, the cliche answer that you always get, right, is, oh, it's 90% mental and it's 10% physical. Well, you know, when, when you're carrying a log for, you know, 12 miles on top of full kit, it doesn't necessarily feel mental. It feels pretty physical. I mean, granted, you have to get over, you know, there, your body can do a lot more than you realize. And we all know that people, athletes prove that all the time. Operators prove that all the time. It's, it, that's happened throughout history. But it, in, in the moment, it certainly feels like it's more physical. Um, I would say, it, you know, nobody really knows the answer. Is it 90-10? Is it 50-50? Is it 70-30? Nobody, nobody really knows. And, you know, the better shape you are, the less mental, uh, the less psychological and emotional turmoil you're probably going to have in trying to do that. But by the same token, the stronger you are mentally, the easier it's going to be able to be to, to push yourself. Um, I, I'll tell you a, a little thing just from personal experience. I did special forces assessment and selection coming off the street is, you know, I'd been a, a corrections officer working night shift and a college student. And I was in 20 special forces group. We got mobilized. Um, and then I found myself in special forces selection with no train up at all, you know, just, you know, I had been staying in reasonably good shape, but I hadn't done like uh, a preparation, you know, kind of ramping myself up to going to, to SFAS. So for me, it, you know, the physical aspect of it was especially challenging and I had to rely on mental toughness to kind of overcome that because I wasn't in the shape that I had been when I was on active duty full time. I certainly wasn't the shape of a lot of the people that were in my selection class with me, um, but I was able to make it through. And again, it was just you know because the concept of quitting is completely alien to me, um, which is probably given what my MRIs look like is, is probably not necessarily a good thing. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I hope, that's kind of a roundabout way. I hope that kind of answers your question. The answer is it's both, but certainly if you're lacking in one of the two, you're going to have to make up for it in that other area. Well, and I'm going to come back to that. What branch of service were you in, Doc? And and, and talk a little bit about just the entire like selection process in terms of the, the length of time that you go through it. Yeah. So um, I entered the Army in 1984. Uh, two weeks out of high school, I had a con uh, what they call an unassigned ranger contract. So I was on my way to the ranger regiment, uh, did basic training at Fort Benning, Georgia as an infantryman. And I did airborne school immediately afterwards. Uh, basic training at the time was uh, four, four months ish, uh, maybe a little bit more than that. Um, uh, airborne school was three weeks. Uh, had a little bit of leave and then reported to what they called at the time was called the Ranger Indoctrination Program, which um, on paper was a three week course. It ended up being a little bit longer than that. Um, went through the Ranger Indoctrination Program, which is a lot of physical stuff, but mental stuff as well. Um, kind of making sure that you're cut out, you, that you are Ranger material, that you're trainable and to teach you some of the basic stuff that you're going to need to know on your first day in your platoon. So you're not totally lost. And then once you get to your platoon, it's kind of an on-the-job training process. And, and every day you're being assessed. You can be kicked out of Ranger Regiment at any time. So over time, you prove yourself to your leadership and you go to Ranger School, which at the time was a 58-day process. Um, after that initial four years... Uh, I got out, I was in the, I enlisted in the, in the special forces national guard in the state of Florida. And when we got mobilized during desert storm, desert shield is when I went to special forces selection, which also mm -hmm. at the time was, was a three week course. Um, it's really two weeks of work, uh, and then kind of half a week in processing, half a week out processing, but you're really the, the, you're under the gun and only getting four hours of sleep and being physically run through the ringer basically for two weeks. So SFAS kind of, kind of equates, you know, the seals have, he have hell week in buds, 
And in special forces, we have SFAS, right? So, uh, and then the, the, the actual Q course, which my initial MOS when I got to SF was, I was an 18 Charlie special forces engineer sergeant, uh, was, was six months of training. Uh, I eventually went back later and, uh, and cross-trained and became a medic, which was uh, a, an additional uh, about 13 months of training to, to get that MOS as well. So. And, and now you are a full doctor, right? You're an emergency room physician. You went, Correct. So what, did you go back? Did you do medical school when you're in the service as well? I did. So uh, after, after I became an SF medic, that was the point that I knew that, that, that medicine was uh, something of a calling for me. And it was something that I was good at, something that I enjoyed. Uh, I went back to a team to work as an SF medic and uh, did that for a few years, but knew that eventually my, my future lay in medicine where, you know, uh, different people in it, you know, p- some people were going to go up the NCO ranks and eventually you know, become a team sergeant, a sergeant major. Uh, others would choose maybe to go to warrant officer. Some would go get a commission and then come back to SF as an SF op- uh, officer. Um, but I knew that my future lay in medicine. So I, I completed my undergraduate by going to night school while I was an operator on active duty, uh, applied to medical school, actually was in the application process when 9-11 occurred. And I accepted medical school and I matriculated in 2002 uh, at the age of 36. Uh, graduated at 40. I was a 40-year-old intern. I did my residency in San Antonio for three years. Uh, and then upon graduation, went back to Fort Bragg, went back to the special operations community assigned to the Joint Special Operations Command there. Well, the way I got, I got asked this question, Doc, and I don't mean to make that light of it, but which was harder, being an older guy with a bunch of younger interns <laughs> who didn't really have their stuff together, or was it harder like to kind of be in a special operations team? Because I'm sure like once you've been in a community <clears throat> like the military and like, like especially special operations where everybody has their stuff squared away, I'm sure you really don't have much patience for dealing with young 20 somethings that might be going a slightly different drama. <laughs> no. And that's a, that's a really good way to put it. It's uh, there. I was, I'm a, I'm a little bit spoiled in my military career. You know, the first solid 17 years of my military career was all in the special operations community, all as an operator. Um, you have the luxury in special operations that, Everyone has been through some type of rigorous selection process that is ongoing, right? Because at any time you can say, yeah, we know you've been here for a couple of years, but guess what? You're a slug. So you're out of here, right? Um, so everyone was selected. Everyone rose to a certain level of technical and tactical proficiency to get there. Everyone was invested, wanted to be there, wanted to prove themselves. You know, they were the type of individuals that were very competitive, Um a lot, a lot of teamwork, a lot of cohesion, a lot of lifting, holding each other accountable and lifting each other up. Um, and then you get to, you get to med school and it's a little bit different. It's not, you know, it's not like Lord of the flies. It's not every man for himself or every man and woman for himself, but it's, you're very much on your own. Um, you know, you, you network and you kind of form a little tribe and you help each other out. Uh, but in the end, you're going to rise and fall on your own merits. I mean, much, much like any course, you know, whether we're talking about medical school or, uh, you know, BUDS or the PJ course, Ranger school, whatever it might be. Um, when I got to residency, and that's a, this is to the heart of your question, that's when I really started to see not everybody who wears a uniform is in it for the same reasons that I'm in it. You know, I, I was always in it to I want I want to be a part of something bigger than myself. I want to I want to I want the pride associated with being around consummate professionals that are at the top of their game. I want to contribute to that. If I am deemed worthy, I want to continue to be a part of that. And unfortunately in the military medical community, you, especially at that time frame, mm. there were a lot of people that were in it for themselves, that this was a way to get a free education, to get some benefits, uh, and then moonlight on the side and, you know, this, Hey, the military has, I got a steady income in the military. I got my health and my dental and my life insurance all covered, but it, you know, in on the weekends and, and a few times a month, I'm going and moonlighting over at this other civilian hospital. And that's where I'm really making bank. And that's where my concentration is. And I'm going to start ramping up to get ready for my civilian practice and feathering their own nest, so to speak, you know, not uh, where, whereas I came from a community that you said the word deployment, and people would be pushing each other out of the way. How do I get on that plane? Just get me on that plane. 
because I want to deploy because deploying is a privilege. And that's what I signed up for. Now I found myself in a community where people were trying to avoid deployment, you know, mm. signing up for fellowship. So they didn't have to deploy for three years um, saying, oh, I'm too involved in research or, you know, I'm I'm the program director at a teaching facility. I can't I can't possibly deploy that. That's going to disrupt this residency program. Um, and I was really unaccustomed to that. And and I talk about it in the book a little bit disgusted by that as well. Well, isn't it? I mean, when you look at that and I was and I was thinking about <clears throat> about what, what about with honed is that being around people who are same who are very mission oriented mm -hmm. whether you're in the military or whether like you're in sports it kind of forces you to to perform your best mm -hmm. and, and that's the one thing i mean the, the one thing that that surprised me doc about meeting various special operators is you have this media image about people in the special operations community kind of being the thugs and the meatheads and the, uh, we're gonna go out and you know seek destroy <laughs> when in reality it's been the opposite they've been the more thoughtful they've been the more they're very, they're not, they're not quick tempered. They're very even keeled. And they, there's definitely, there's always, what, what strikes me about anybody that I've met from that community is there's a silent intensity there. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, they don't wear what they do on their sleeves. So what was it like? Because you, you write about being a little bit older than some of the other community when, you, when you're deployed. What's it like to be a member of that community and to constantly have to be looking over your shoulder to be looking for somebody to push you because you know you could be dropped? And, and is that is that peer pressure good? In your experience, how is that peer pressure good for you? You know, I think it's absolutely good. I think uh, so. Um, oddly enough, I had uh, I had a conversation with uh, a with a special forces sergeant major. Uh, and this was I had been in group for a few years, and my former group sergeant major who was a guy named henry bone anybody that's listening to this that was in special forces in the 90s will immediately recognize that name and a lot of people have very heated opinions of sergeant major bone which which i won't get into i got along just fine with him but he ended up becoming um i believe it was u.s socom sergeant major so now instead of just being in charge of sf he was also overall you know a couple steps above ranger regiment as well because we all fell under that same umbrella and he approached me when one day we were we were in the group area and uh he happened to be going through the group area because his office was just across the street and he, he pulled me aside sergeant simpson i got a question for me i know you came from ranger regiment and he goes this whole thing about that they can just kick people out at any time he said, uh, that that's a problem. You know, they have guys who make it through, they made it through basic training. They make it through airborne school. They make it through the Ranger indoctrination program. And then they get to their platoon and two or three months down the road, these guys are getting kicked out. And I'm looking at the numbers and they're, they're kicking a fair bit of people out. And I think I'm going to talk about a policy where they can't do that anymore, where they have to maybe move them to another company. Sorry about that. Maybe Sorry. move them to another company. Uh, and give them another chance. I, I don't think it's right that they're they're getting ready to uh, or that they're able to do that. And it's a and it's a problem. Uh, and I said, well, Sergeant Major, I, I got to disagree with you on that. And he looked at me kind of surprised. Sergeant Majors aren't uh, accustomed to people disagreeing with them. And I said, you have to understand that as in the Ranger Battalion, the sword of Damocles hanging over your head on a daily basis is a huge motivator that those times when you think I can maybe slack off just a little bit, uh, because that's that, unfortunately that is human nature. You know, not, not everybody is an a type self-starter self motivator all the time. Some people need that little bit of external motivation. And I said, that's a powerful motivator. And, you know, and on days you think, you know, Hey, maybe I can just phone it in. That's what kicks you in the ass and says, no, no, I can't. Because at any time in my career in Ranger Regiment, somebody can single me out and say, you're not upholding the standard. You're gone. You're, you're going to another unit. And I said, that's one of the, that's not, that's not a detriment. That, that's a strength. And that's important. And I said, to be honest with you, Sergeant Major, the fact that we're not doing that in special forces, because at the time we weren't in the nineties. Um, and the reason being is, is because it costs so much money. That was always the excuse we heard. Well, it costs so much money to train one of us that by the time they get to a team, we have tens of thousands or hundred thousands of dollars invested into this individual. So the fact that he got to a team and his team didn't think he was pulling his weight, well, you know, maybe we need to give him another chance, put him on another team for a while. Oh, he didn't do so well. Well, maybe we need to send him to work in the arms room for a while, or maybe he can go be the Colonel's driver for six months and then, and, and, and get his shit together and then come back. 
Um, and that was a problem at that time. We did, we had a little bit of a quality control issue in SF in the mid nineties. So I think it is important that you have, and it, it's not malignant, you know, it's not guys going, Hey, you're going to do this or I'm going to kick your ass. Or you're going to do this. Or we're going to kick you out of here. It's a, a lot of it is the, the, the thought of me looking at one of my peers and seeing a look of disappointment in their eyes to me was more powerful than anything else because these were individuals that I highly respected. And uh, the thought of not having their respect in, in, in reciprocating uh, was not something that I, that I even wanted to entertain. So I was always going to uh, uh, maintain a high standard in myself because I didn't want to let the team down. Well, isn't, and, and that's what, that's what impresses me about that type of community and about that type of, that type of policy. Now, would that maybe be the best policy at a software sales company or something else where so you cut dead weight when somebody's not performing? Maybe it would be. I don't know. As I think about that, it, it might not be the worst policy, but yeah. I can understand. I can have a little more understanding for like, well, let's see if this person can kind of catch up with it. But when you're working in a field where literally a split second decision could be in life or death, not just for you, but an entire team or an entire group of individuals, no, you can't. You can't have that slacker attitude, right? Because yeah, if I have it and you allow it to fester me, then somebody else could have it. Somebody else could have it, and then you know the whole. All of a sudden, everything goes downhill. Yeah. No, that, that's and it's things like that are contagious, right? We, you know, it's with anything. It, it any organization anyone's ever been a part of, right? We've all seen this before. That uh, it's a domino effect. That's you know somebody starts to slack over here. And, and a leadership has a lot to do with it too. You know, if, if your, if your boss is coming in 15 minutes late, you know, was, you know, making jokes about how long the line at Starbucks was, well, you know, th that there's a trickle down effect on that and, it, and it's going to affect everybody. But, you know, the, the people that come in and they're on time or early all the time and they're, uh, they're ready to go when they, you know, when they hit a meeting, they've, they've got their notes and they're, 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 they're locked and loaded and ready to go. And, and you know that they're dependable, you know, that you give them a task, they're going to, they're going to meet or exceed the standard on that task, and they're going to deliver on time or before. Those are the individuals that really shine. That's a true meritocracy, right? So those are the individuals that shine in an organization, and also that lift up their peers, because it, everybody looks around, and they're like, God, you know, Jim over there is just really kicking ass. I want to, I want to be more like Jim. You know, uh, so that should be something that is rewarded. It should be something that's elevated. Um, don't even get me on this whole, you know, we, you know, everybody gets a trophy mentality and we're not, there's a, there's a thing now that the, you know, uh, entire States want to do away with gifted and talented programs because it makes other kids feel bad. And uh, that, that, that's, that's it's bullshit. <laughs> you know, I, I agree 100. percent And I'm thinking, you know, though I'm thinking of like coworkers and friends and and teammates. When I see somebody kicking butt and, and busting hump, it makes me want to push that much harder, right? If you know that somebody is sacrificing working, is sacrificing one or two nights a week with a kid to try to get a project done, it lets you know you don't want to be that guy they look at because you didn't get the didn't get the thing. And I can imagine yeah. that that's only like a, a scale of what what it must be like. But to shift gears back to your experience, you were still in the community when you're a little bit older. And what, what did that, I mean, how did you stay fit? I mean, how hard was it for you to stay fit? I mean, well, let me ask this the question this way. What is the expectation that once you make it into the teams or once you make it into the SF community, mm -hmm. what's, that, what's the peer pressure like for your fitness level? And what did you do to maintain your fitness as you, as you became one of the older operators in, in your local, in your group? Yeah, it was... Uh when I was an operator, it was not a huge issue. Right. So, and even though I had a very similar lifestyle, you know, my time assigned to JSOC as a, as a physician, really my, my operator life ended at age 36. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, in my opinion, 36, I was only three years out of my prime, right. I, I consider 33 years old to kind of be, uh, uh, and this is, I get this from a lot of uh, Eastern Eastern philosophy ideas on, on martial arts and, and when, when somebody reaches their peak, but I really think it is somewhere around 
your, your, your early thirties, right. Is, is kind of when you peak, because that's when you have that unique combination of physically, I can still do everything that I could do, uh, or, or 99% of what I could do in my early twenties. Also, I've figured out how to do things better. Right. Um, so as an operator and, and, you know, not speaking necessarily for me uh, as an individual, cause like I said, I left the team at 36, but the guys who did get older and maintain that, and that was a lot, became a lot more common in the age of the global war on terror because guys weren't retiring at 20 anymore. It's like, we're at war. I'm not going anywhere. Right. There's, 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 there's still bad guys out there need killing. I'm staying on active duty till they kick me off. Um, it, it was just, it was a matter of, of training smart, not hard. Right. And, and utilize it. You got to utilize more resources. You know, it's like, it's like, like anything it, you have to recognize that my body is not as pliable as it was, right? Uh, physical tasks become a little bit more different, difficult. Recovery takes a little bit longer. It's a little bit more difficult to learn things, right? You don't have the neuroplasticity that you had uh, in your younger days. So you have to adapt. And it, it just means putting in more of your own time, right? So whereas as a, as a 19-year-old, um, I could start drinking at five o'clock on Friday and drink the whole weekend and, and run five miles still partially drunk on Monday morning and get away with that. Um, as you get in your thirties and forties and beyond, you can't do that. You know, it's, it's okay. I got to take a dedicated and have a ded dedicated active recovery day and, and core strength training day to kind of ramp up and, Oh, I better damn sure make sure I take my supplements and I get enough water on Sunday because we're having a, a we're going to have a hard PT session on Monday. So it, it's a little bit more incumbent on you. You know, the things that nature has taken away from you, you kind of have to plan around. You mean you actually have to prepare to be physically active? What you can't just go out, <laughs> you can't just go out and do it, do it anymore. I mean that that's that's the whole thing, right? When you're 25, you can you can you can get out of whatever situation you're in and, and start and go do something almost immediately. At 45, you think, know, okay, wait, how long of a warm up do I need? When do I need to be started? Because you need to kind of back down from like, I mean, is that is that been your experience? Yeah, it's you know to to quote Owen Wilson from Shanghai Noon. You, you've lost your wing in it privileges, right? You, you, <laughs> you don't yeah. just to get to wing it anymore. You know, you, you got to put some thought into this. You know, the fact that in my early twenties, I would run a pair of running shoes until the soles fell off. Right. Uh, now when I start, I, I can feel if I'm wearing, if I'm in a pair of running shoes that are five months old, I can feel the difference. Yeah. Right. I, I, yeah. I feel it literally all the way up to mid spine. Right. Uh, because I, I'm, you know, I'm not one of these minimalist two, two millimeter sole runner guys. Right. So I'm a heel striker. I'm old school. You, I can't unlearn that. Um, so you, again, yeah, you, you know, everything you have to, there's more care is involved in everything, your gear, your diet, your sleep, your recovery, what you're going to do. You know, it's, uh, uh, I have, it used to be, um, I absolutely had to do my workouts first thing in the morning on an empty stomach because it was all about pushing it till you might puke. Right. So it was get up. All right. I'm up. I drink some water. I'm ready. Here we go. You know, an, an hour and a half of sheer intensity and boom, I've checked that block and it's over. Now I get up. I drink a first, first thing I do is drink water, right? I drink 16 ounces of water. As soon as I wake up, I take my time. I make a light breakfast. I have a light breakfast. I check some emails. I have a cup of coffee. Oh, caffeine. This is good for me. This is waking me up. I'm moving around. I'm going up and down the stairs in the house, you know, to get my workout clothes, everything else, getting all my synovial fluid going. Uh, you know, if I tried to do a cold start, you know, <laughs> if you took, you took a 57 Chevy and, uh, and you were in Michigan in the upper peninsula and you just turned the key and floored it and took off down the street, terrible things are going to happen to that car. Um, and you get, that's how you got to treat your body. You know, and I think you, you come from a, such a unique perspective because you've studied the body, you've studied medicine and you, you've been a part of a community where elite physical performance is, is the standard. And so what have you learned about, I mean, you kind of talk about touching on it and taking care of the body, but from your standpoint, what's more important as we age, and this is from like your medical experience as well as your operating experience. 
what's more important as we age? Is it pushing like that heavy weight or is it taking the time and really learning how to control your body and move your body? And then the follow-up to that is how have your workouts changed over the last yeah. number of years? How have you kind of evolved your approach to staying fit? The, the shorter answer is I think the latter becomes more important. So it's not just about um, uh, doing a PR, a squat PR, and, you know, concentrating on that. And there are guys my age and a little bit older that that's kind of their thing, you know, and I've, I've had them on my podcast and, and they talk about it. But I think if you want true well-rounded fitness and you want longevity, which is a word that I throw around quite a bit, um, you have to modify it and you have to look at a more whole body and holistic approach, not just to the time you're spending working out, but to the time you spend warming up, to the time you spend in recovery, to the time you spend sleeping, everything. You have to approach it, you know, on, on a, it's, it's a lifestyle. It's not just, I do whatever the hell I want. I, I outside of the gym, I live like I was still in my twenties, but inside the, inside the gym, I'm all business. No, you don't get to do that at, at our age. You don't get to do that. So it, it has to be more holistic approach that I'm leading a healthy lifestyle in and out of the gym. And then I'm modifying what I'm doing in the gym. So um, I talk about in the book that, it, that it, I kind of had to figure out on my own because I used to think that it was, well, if I can, I can run, uh, if I can run two to three miles pretty damn fast and I can run eight miles and not feel like I'm going to die, then I, okay, cardio, check. That's done. Then, uh, you know, push-ups, sit-ups, uh, some, some squats or some leg exercises, you know, the, the basic, the basic exercises that we, we all learned from our gym teacher in, in middle school, uh, you know, bench press, squat, deadlift, military press. Some people call it the strict press or there's an, other names for it. I guess people didn't like the term military press for whatever <laughs> reason, you know, curls, uh, you know, dips, all these very, very basic exercises. It's like, okay, you do those and you pretty much covered all the muscles. Well, you covered the prime movers, but I found that I have to concentrate a lot more on things like, uh, you know, I, I talk about this in the book that, uh, you know, I break it down into, you have strength, power, which is slightly different than strength, although the two are closely intertwined. You have your endurance, uh, you have mobility, you have flexibility and mobility, which are, again, closely inter intertwined, but uh, not exactly the same. And then you have durability. So uh, durability has to do with all the stabilization muscles that we normally neglect. These are all the chronic injuries that you have in older age because you weren't working durability when you were younger. So that's working your core, working, working the muscles that, are, you know, your erect, your, uh, your erector spinae and your paraspinous muscles, um, your, uh, all the stabilization muscles for your knees, for your hips, uh, all the muscles uh, in your in your shoulder girdle, you know, keeping those stable. So to prevent these injuries, um, that's all your durability stuff. Mobility is the ability to actively move through a range of movement. So whereas flexibility, Bruce Lee bending over, touching his forehead to his knees, that's flexibility. Him yeah. kicking a light fixture up over his head, that's mobility, right? So he can do the same chain of movement actively that he can passively, and they're both important. Strength is what everybody thinks it is, right? That, that's your PR. That's you know how much you can bench press or whatever. So how, if, if how much you can squat is strength, then utilizing that same kinetic chain to see how to weight a sled with 150 pounds and then push it 20 yards and seeing how fast you can do it, that is, is power. And then endurance is, you know, the last one that I'll talk about is, you know, you have your normal cardiovascular endurance. So, you know, what your heart rate is, you know, looking at your resting heart rate, looking at what heart rate you can maintain for a long period of time. So that's standard cardiovascular endurance, but then also muscular endurance. You know, are you doing something you know, doing exercises that work, not just your heart is beating because you're continually moving, but you're doing more complex movements, you know, whether those are burpee box jumps, mm -hmm. uh, something of that nature. So your, your muscles are getting used to, oh gosh, I'm depleting glycogen stores. I've got to, I've got to shift my, my metabolic cycle and, and see how long that I can maintain it. Right. So all of these things are important and, and having knowledge and all that, you know, and fortunately I had, uh, a science undergraduate and, and medical school. So I, I, I knew 
I knew how muscles worked. I knew how the nervous system worked. I knew about the Krebs cycle. Um, I, I knew enough about orthopedics and about sports injuries to identify, you know, areas that, that needed to be improved, had the potential for improvement. And probably most importantly is it, is it gave me the ability to kind of we sift through stuff and see what was sound advice that came from somebody who was an expert based on, on their position and somebody who was probably, you know, either just a gym bro or just some idiot that with access to the internet. And that's kind of the most important thing is cause I don't, I don't, I don't know all of this stuff, but I know where to look. I know who to ask. And there's a, when, you know, when I was writing this book, I was regularly emailing, texting and calling fitness trainers, nutritionists, um, physicians that are involved in, in hormone replacement, you know, people that had already done the research on supplement vitamins and supplementation. So, um, you don't have to know everything, just know who to ask. Well, and that, no, that's a great point. And you just broke down. I mean, you broke down all the components of fitness, very, just very logically and sequentially. And I, and I think that a lot of times as we age, one of the things that happens is we don't, we kind of back off the intensity a little bit, right? I mean, we kind of understand what we should be doing, but we think of intensity as kind of being the young man's game, which looking at your, your previous training of going through, going through some type of boot camp program, I have to, I have to be honest, Doc, I'm, I'm always kind of like roll my eyes when I hear people talk like I'm doing a, a boot camp workout program because mm-hmm. I'm like, you don't understand. The, the purpose of a boot camp program in the military mm-hmm. is to put people through an extreme amount of stress so then when, you can, when they get out into an, into an extremely stressful environment, they don't freak the hell out. I mean, am I wrong in that? I mean, that's, that's the basic, my understanding of the basic boot camp is you put people through stress so they can learn how to live and deal with stress, right? Yeah. So well, it, a, a boot camp program has two purposes. Uh, you know, wh- one is, as you said, it's you know, a little bit, of, there's some stress inoculation there. But also it's a foundation, you know, it's to lay the foundation because you have to figure. So let, let's look at when I went through boot camp in 1984. Um, they, the military had just at that time stopped having people run in boots in basic training. Hmm. Up until that point, we we're still running in boots in basic training. Well, the reason that they stopped doing that was in the 40s, 50s and 60s, the average, the average male on a typical day to day basis wore boots. Right. Mm-hmm. If you were if you had a blue collar job somewhere, you wore boots. If you were like in some type of management capacity, you were wearing some type of thick leather shoe. Right. So people's feet were conditioned differently. And then in the 70s and 80s, now everybody's wearing tennis shoes as their daily shoes. So what they found out in, in at some point in the early 80s was all these basic trainees, their feet were turning to hamburger hmm. from running in boots. So they're like we got to get away from, you know, we got to get away from, you know, a there was things that they didn't know about why it was a bad idea. Like, you know, just having that much weight on your feet and running is a bad idea. The soles are not built for running. Uh, they don't cushion any impact and a bunch of other reasons, but they did the smart thing and they did away with running in boots. Um, but uh, I've kind of got a little off track on where I was going here, but you know, basically what I'm trying to say is, uh, everything that you do in basic training is, uh, is weeding you out, getting your body used to that type of stress. So, you know, my body uh, is uh, as an 18 year old coming out of high school, even though I had played sports in school, I wasn't used to doing things like forced marches with a pack on my back and a helmet on my head. I I wasn't used to doing things like that. I wasn't used to doing things like uh, uh, an obstacle bayonet course in full military kit. These were not things that I was accustomed to. So I had to I had to get my body accustomed to that, get my mind accustomed to that. Right. So it's like you say, it's stress inoculation. So when I, if I do have to encounter some physical and mental stress like that in combat, it's not completely alien to me, but also it's laying a foundation. It's teaching you, this is how we do things. So now that you know how we do things, now you can go on to your unit and your learning process is not over. It's going to continue but we've now laid the foundation. We we've interest, you know, you know how to lace your boots, you know how to take your rifle apart and point it in the right direction. You know the basic stuff. Now we're going to we're going to take it from there. And if you're doing some type of physical boot camp program, it should Unfortunately, people look at these boot camp programs as like uh as like a race that they're training for, like a Spartan race or something else. So I'm going to do this boot camp program. And the night after I finish the boot camp program, I'm going to go out to this massive taco and margarita dinner. And then I'm going to take a week off 
And then I'm going to meander around and kind of go back to whatever bullshit low intensity workout I was doing before. Right. Well, that's not what you should be doing. You know, a boot camp program. And if, if there's a gym running a boot camp, the boot camp should be just that, that we're going to run you through a three week program. And then, Hey, guess what? That three week program is going to now prepare you to go into our long-term 52 week program that we're going to, we're going to guide you through. Right. All the three week program was is to make sure you know how to do uh, a, a, a split squat and a, and a, a Romanian deadlift properly. And now that we've got that block checked, right, and we've smoked you a little bit because we've also assessed your level of fitness, we're going to use that information and use the knowledge that you have and, and you're going to build from that. And if you're not using a boot camp program as a foundation to build off of, if you're just using it as a challenge, I think you can find better ways to challenge yourself. No, that's well said. And, and, and to your point, the, the better <clears throat> the better weightlifting studios and the better CrossFit studios are doing that about where somebody like me comes in and I say, I want to join the studio. They're not going to let me take the workouts right away. If they're good, they're going to shuttle me into yeah. go take these, go, go do these, these, these workouts for a month learn the lifts, learn the system, then, so I like that, I like that analogy, but, but here, here's where I'm, part of the other thing is, when you look at some of those things, you mentioned the key word is stress. Mm -hmm. People forget that exercise is physical stress on the body, and even as we age, we have to stress the body. We mm -hmm. have to physically push ourselves, not with every workout, but with every, I would say probably two or three times a week, because we don't want to, personally, I don't want to ever lose that edge. I mean, when you look at, at your, your, your training background, mm -hmm. one of the things that came out of those extremely challenging conditioning was that mental, that mental toughness, and that mindset of, I can get through anything. I got through that X week program. I can get, they dropped me off behind enemy lines. I'm good to go. Point mm -hmm. me in the direction I'm supposed to go and t set me loose because you've, you, you, you've persevered through tough stuff. But isn't that one of the benefits of exercise as we age? is maintaining that confidence and maintaining, for lack of a better term, Doc, I'm gonna call it swagger. That may or may not be yeah. the technical correct research <laughs> term, but we want, I, term. My, my opinion, we wanna keep our swag. Doesn't mean we're gonna get on the bench press and jack out 225 like we might have when we were 19, mm -hmm. but we still wanna have that swag, right? Yeah, no, absolutely, we still wanna have that swag. And, uh, and I can still do 225. <laughs> 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 to brag on myself a little bit. Um, but it's, you, you mentioned, you talk about the stress and that exercise should be stress. And my, my good friend, Dr. Drew Wingy, who was one of my classmates in residency, and he's written a couple of books and he wrote a book uh, called the program personal evolution. And he equates, uh, the stress that you put on your body in exercise and what that triggers on a cellular level to cause for lack of a better word evolution on a cellular and individual level. Yes. Granted, you know, technically don't send me hateful emails. Yes. I know that's not <laughs> technically evolution. Right. But I mean, it's, it's no different than, you know, the stress, the stress of hard winters that our ancestors went under the, that made them discover things like, you know, how to cure meat and how to can vegetables and, and do, you know, that, you know, e evolution, uh, the evolution of, uh, you know, the, the throwing spear, the bow, the, uh, uh, the slingshot, you know, all, all these things that, that, that we evolved over time. And it was because of pressure to survive where there was an anywhere where there was an absence uh, of the pressure to survive. You know, if, if your answer, if, if your ancestors were in a place where all they had to do was roll out of a hammock every day, pick something off the nearest tree, they didn't even have to worry about identifying whether it was poison or not. And then an animal would just come wandering by and they'd kick it in the head and it would be dead and they could cook it zero evolution is going to occur. They're not going to develop the wheel. They're not going to develop edged weapons. They're not going to develop the ideal throwing spear or the ideal bow, the ideal sling. Uh, none of that's going to happen. Right? So it, it's similar with your body. If you're not, if you're, there's not a crucible there, if you're not putting stress on those individual muscle cells, if you're not pushing your, your nervous system a little bit to the edge from time to time, there's not going to be growth. There's not going to be improvement. There's going to be stagnation. There's going to be atrophy. Uh, and you're just, you're going to lose that swagger that you had when you're younger because you're not, you know, and that's why in the book, you know, I call it the edge, you know, you're going to, you're going to lose that edge. Um, and the only way to keep that edge is to, is to keep taking stone to steel 
as often as possible, as often as it will allow. Now, granted, as that steel gets old, and I remember one of the first knives I ever had was, it had been my grandfather's and then my dad's and then was eventually mine. It had been sharpened so much that the blade was about half of the half of the thickness that it had been before, mm. you know, it, it looked, it went from looking like a hunting knife to like a paring knife over the generations. So, it, you know, that's uh, a little bit of what happens to your body as well. You know, you can, from too much stress, you're going to wear it down over time, but you just have to be mindful to that. Well, well, and that's a great example of it, right? Because we don't want to, and that, that's the way I look at it too, is as we get older, we don't want to back off in the gym. We don't want to take it easy. I mean, no, we don't need to Put ourselves through the same level of stress we did when we were younger but we should be able to handle ourselves and, and you're right because i mean we have to take for listeners we have to take a couple steps back and it's only been the last 100 to 120 years that we've had such easy choices in life i mean before mm -hmm. two or three hundred years ago and basically every person we'd see are we either going to fornicate it with it or we're going to fight fight it you yeah. know those, those are the only those are too much problems, right so <laughs> so now i can sit down on my phone and i can do all these apps. i can find a mate via an app i can order food via an app i, I don't need to leave my house via an app we don't have anything making pushing our body to make it stronger and we only get stronger through through force i mean that what you referenced is with the recycling is mechanotransduction and and i talk about that here i've talked about that before with listeners and that's mechanical force creates chemical change in the body. Mm -hmm. And it really is. And so with that, as you've seen and as you've gone through this, I mean, how critical is it just from like an endocrine standpoint from now put your doctor hat on, you're no longer just the, the special operator, but from your doctor hat, how important is it that stress for, for guys our age to maintain the endocrine profile, testosterone and growth hormone and whatnot, things that keep us, that keep us rocking and rolling? Yeah. So like anything, there's, there's, there's a sweet spot in there, right? So, you know, too much stress is bad, too much stress. Your cortisol goes through the roof, your testosterone drops out because what's happening when you stress yourself too much, right? Is, uh, is your body says, wow, times are really hard. So maybe we shouldn't reproduce hmm. because times are really hard, right? So this isn't, this is not a good time. Like, like increasing the population is not, and I'm oversimplifying. Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I get that. Right. So, you know, basically that that's why when you're not sleeping and you put on, you know, you, you get a, you get more body fat, your testosterone goes down, your, your cortisol goes up, your libido drops out. Right. Cause again, that's nature's going, man, shit, shit's not, you know, this is not, you know, do, let's not be adding to the gene pool right now. You know, other things. stuff is more important. Yeah, other stuff focus, is more important, right? Let's, let's sort, sort your shit out. You know, <laughs> get right with you, and then we can worry about that, right? You're not right with you right now. So uh, that that sweet spot, and you know, you talked about you know you know how hard you can push yourself. You have to recognize that sweet spot in the gym too. That I'm pushing myself. I'm not pushing myself to the point of injury, but I am pushing myself to the point of stress. And knowing you know knowing when I'm gonna I'm gonna dial back either on intensity or frequency, uh, you, you have to be okay with doing that, but you can still stress yourself and that's going to optimize, uh, everything. Cause you want your, you want your cortisol down. You want your testosterone up. Some of us are so burned out by a lifetime of doing this. Like I was being on reverse cycle. I probably got a little TBI that I've been in denial about. So I'm on, I'm on TRT. Um, for some people, that's a necessity. For other people, you want to opt. If you're optimizing, you're working out, so you're building more lean muscle mass. Your testosterone's going up. Your fats going. Your body fat's going down, which means estrogen, estradiol, that's going down. You're getting the optimal amount of sleep, so your cortisol is down. Your thyroid is happy, right? Your thyroid is not battling this weird shit that you're trying to do. You know, trying to stimulate you and keep your metabolism in a zone that you're fighting to keep it out of. Um, your, your pancreas is secreting the right amount of insulin and all of your insulin receptors are still appropriately receptive to that insulin. So you don't develop an insulin resistance and become a type two diabetic. So, and, and the keys to all of this is, is healthy lifestyle, moderation, workout, sunlight, fresh air, you know, all the things we were told literally in kindergarten that were good for us are good for us. Well, that's going back. I mean, it's even before that. I mean, that's going back a few thousand years. I mean, to what Aristotle wrote about, right? I mean, in terms of challenging the the brain as well as the body. But the one thing too, I think that's so cool, is that we're at, we're at an age now, Doc, and you you're a couple years older than me, but we're at an age where we now know so much more 
about how the body adapts yes. to exercise. We know so yeah. much more about the benefits. So on you a, and on I- personal, On a personal level and on a broader scope. Uh, everything, yeah. so now, but, but here's the thing that we know much better of is that we know how to take care of ourselves after the hard workout. Because this is the one area where I think we've really, we don't credit ourselves with enough. And I'm us, I mean, just being, whether it's fitness industry or, or people in general, or fitness enthusiasts in general, whereas 10 to 15 years ago, the off day or the rest day was a four letter word. If you said rest mm -hmm. or, or anything like that, people are like, I'm not, I can push through it. Now we understand that, you know what? We need sleep. We need that recovery. We need, maybe we buy a percussion gun. Maybe we wear, wear compression pants. Maybe we go you do the IR, the infrared sauna every now and then, or maybe mm -hmm. I did something for the first time the other night. And this is one to share this with you because of your background, your experience. But I went and did a, um, a med kind of a breathing meditation workout of where you go through some breath work, but then the at the end of it, you're supposed to sit in a 42 degree pool for a few minutes. And and there's a lot of, I mean, and, and for listeners, what you're doing there is you're manipulating the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. Where breathing, doing the breath work is a, is a parasympathetic stimulation of basically of, of the autonomous, an autonomous nervous system that regulates everything. And then we you submerge yourself in a 40 degree water, there's an immediate fight or flight response sure. <laughs> where your SNS, where your sympathetic nervous system is now dumping up and dump, dumping cortisol. So logically, I understood what was happening, but I got into that cold water. I tapped out after 25 seconds because I'm like, you know, it was just like that, that mind body connection. I couldn't disassociate from it. Mm -hmm. But to the point being that that type of stress, like doing the breath work of doing a different type of stress to the system of going hypoxic, but then introducing the cold the cold water, it pissed me off. I mean, I have to be honest, it pissed me off that I that I let it get to me that quickly, right? So what yeah. do you think I'm gonna be doing? What do you think my my inclination is that I'm gonna start doing now going forward for a little bit? Uh, I'm imagining that you're gonna try to continue to stress inoculate yourself to get over that. So whatever your PR was for time in that cold tank, you're gonna be looking to double that at some point in the next couple of months. And that's it. But and, and to your point, that's an example of a healthy of a different type of healthy stressor mm -hmm. somebody could add to their life. And, and where I'm going with that, it doesn't mean I'm going to start playing with cold and, and for every workout. It just means that for a period of time now, I might introduce a different stress to my body because you're absolutely right. We don't want to overdo it, but we need to kind of find what I like to refer to as that baby bear. Right. Because mm -hmm. Papa Bear was always too much. Mama bear was always mm -hmm. too little. And so when it comes to the right type of, I mean, you're, you're searching for your baby bear. I'm mm -hmm. searching for my baby bear yep. and listeners, every, every listener is going to have to find their own baby bear of the, of the right amount of stress. But, but right. I mean, to get back to that question about the cold is, isn't it, isn't that the right way to look at that type of stuff of where it doesn't mean you're going to change your life and do cold every day, but you understand the benefit of, of being able to play with that type of stressor. Yeah. And, and you also understand your, you know, stress inoculation is something that uh, it's something that in the special operations community we've done for a long time. You know, it's uh, we we do things. You know, we we you know you've heard the term embrace the suck, right? Uh, we, and there, there's a lot of terms we use. You know, gut check, eating the shit sandwich. You know, uh, you look at you know you look at you look at seals in the surf in the Pacific Ocean in Hell Week, right? Embracing the suck, right? And you know, somebody from the outside might look at that. These, you know, these guys have their arms length. They've got vests on in case one of them gets washed out to sea. Their lips are blue. Their teeth are chattering. And it's like, what, what's, you know, what's the, what's the point in that? You know, that's, what does that have to do with kicking in a door and going in there and, and taking out terrorists? You know, I just, I don't get it. And it's, if, if you're used to being uncomfortable, then when you have to be uncomfortable, it's not completely alien to you, right? Because because what was it, it was like for you to be that new type of uncomfortable? It was 25 seconds of fuck this, I'm out of here, right? So you yeah, yeah you don't want to when it, when you're uncomfortable and you, and your life and other people's lives are on the line, you don't want that to be the first time you're uncomfortable. Right. You don't want that to be a surprise. You don't want to jump scare your first time out. Right. You want to be stress inoculated. And we knew in the soft community because in I was stress inoculated out the wazoo in the Rangers. Right. We were cold. We were tired. We were hungry. We were rained on. We were snowed on. We were in chest deep swamp. We were in blistering heat. Um, we were pushed to the point of passing out and needing an IV. 
right? We had, we had gone through this crucible in multiple forms many times. So then when it's, when it's that, you know, whatever, 500 meters to the chopper under fire or up the hill because we're taking fire, but we got to take this guy out because nobody can, you know, nobody's coming to save us. Uh, that's not completely, that situation is new to you, but the difficulty is not new to you. The stress is not new to you. And that little part of your brain says, oh yeah, okay. It's, we've eaten a shit sandwich before. This is a slightly, this is on rye bread instead <laughs> of wheat bread, but we, we can do this. All right. Uh, so it's important that you do that. So how can we do that? It, it, your book honed is about, is targeted towards men over 40. So what are your ways? What are ways that we can stress inoculate ourselves? Because in all honesty, I can see the benefit of it and I get it, but I'm not about to go out and try to try out for the teams at 49 years old. I mean, yeah. whether or not I have the mental fortitude to it is one thing, but just the physical ability <laughs> ain't going to happen. Yeah. Um, but what, what can we do? In, in your experience, what are some good stress inoculators that we could start trying to do at our age that are age appropriate and life appropriate? I think Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is one of the uh, best surrogates out there for uh, for that type of stress inoculation. Because if you're if you're training Brazilian Jiu Jitsu at, at a and most of the you know ninety percent of the schools out there are serious, it hasn't gone the way of you know typical strip mall McDojo martial arts from the nineteen seventies. Um, you're gonna get stress. You're gonna get stress inoculation. There are gonna be times when you have somebody on top of you, putting all their weight on top of you, uh, th you know, with, with the imminent threat of them disarticulating uh, a limb or choking. Uh, that is a stress, you know, in, unless you've completely shut off, uh, you know, your survival instincts, it, it, you're going to feel that you're going to feel what that stress is like that, you know, this is, you know, we call it in, in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, we call it simulated murder. Hmm. Because really, when you tap, you're 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 saying to that other person, "If this would have gone on, you would have killed me, because you would have broken my own arm to the point that I was completely defenseless, or broken my leg to the point that I was completely defenseless, or I would have been choked unconscious, and then you would pummel me into oblivion." So I, I've effectively signaled, I in this in this simulated murder, I was the murder victim. Um, so you really get a point. You you really get a you really get a, a, a true feel for what potentially life-threatening stress is like when you're sparring in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And uh, you get a very accurate gauge of what your, all of those six areas of fitness that I'm talking about, you feel every single one of those, every single one of those. Uh, and, and I can't emphasize it enough. You know, I, I harp on BJJ for how great it is. And people have disagreements with me and they think another martial arts better or the BJJ is overrated or it's become too sport oriented, which I think it has. Um, but it, it's really a great way to put yourself through that crucible and to, to feel what it's like to be under very serious stress. Because it, I, don't, I don't think there's anything out there that simulates it quite on that level because you do, you spar at full speed. Uh, you know, for five minutes, you're literally, it feels like you're fighting for your life, or at least it should. So I think that's, that's one of the best ways that's kind of easily available to everyone when it comes to stress inoculation and, and personal evolution is to do that. And it's, you know, you think I heard the term years ago. In fact, I, I read it, uh, it was in a, there's a, uh, if it got made into a movie, there's a Stephen King story called Dolan's Cadillac. And they, they use the term gym muscles in there, right? That, you know, and the, the, the main character in the book, he's going to a gym for a long period of time. And then he goes out and he takes a job working on a road construction crew. And that's when he finds out, wow, my gym muscles did not necessarily equate to, you know, doing hard work muscles, right? And, and on the mat, on, in the training room, you really figure that out. You're like, wow. So these, yeah, I, I look good in the mirror. But uh, I feel like I'm gonna die. I feel like I'm gonna I'm gonna cough up a lung. I'm physical. I'm trembling. I'm I'm physically exhausted. Uh, and there's just nothing like this. So I I think that if somebody's looking for something that's readily available, that they're gonna get that feeling of what stress inoculation is really like. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is the way to go. No, uh, I I love that. It's funny because I look at that and I ha I haven't started jujitsu lessons now. I mean, it's been it's been on my mind to do that, partly because I have two daughters and my daughters are in elementary school. So Perfect I was waiting. Age, yeah. 
well, I was waiting for them to get a little bit older because I wanted to take some lessons with them. So I asked a, a friend of mine, uh, somebody I interviewed a number of years ago. Um, he was a former uh, professional kickboxer, and right, he was like kind of right there, right at the start of the whole MMA UFC. But I asked him like, what what form? If with two daughters, what form should I have uh, my daughters do? Immediately out of his mouth, he said jujitsu, Brazilian jujitsu. Yeah. Okay, and and his point, and I'm saying this for other parents, other daddy, you know, other girl dads on there is like he's his point and you kind of said this is being on your back is a position of strength uh it's a position it's like a tactic being on your back is actually a tactical advantage in some positions and and i did a little search on youtube and there's this like husband and wife demonstrating a few positions that a woman if the woman were getting attacked in a, in a taxi or an uber and mm-hmm. she immediately she had her husband's like arm he she, i don't know if she had him in a leg lock or an arm bar but immediately within like three seconds she had she could have popped the shoulder out of socket and mm-hmm. i was like okay let me when my daughters are ready you know because i would love to, for them to have that ability but you just reminded me of, of years ago i i sparred with a friend of mine practicing for taekwondo taekwondo tournament and that was a little bit more than a running target pad no nah, man sparring is no joke that is literally the hardest some of the hardest fitness i've ever done you know from yeah. from playing rugby and, and from everything it just was sparring is no joke and that's but to your point i mean that's one of the reasons why i thought about okay i need to look at how do i add bjj mm-hmm. into an overall program yeah because you can i mean you can stress you know you can sign up for muay thai and you can stress inoculate there too but if if you're over 40 okay we get we get some brain shrinkage as we get older uh my my inner ear isn't isn't as compensatory as it was when I was younger. I used to, used to be, I was never off balance. I was never dizzy. I loved roller coasters, anything like that. Now I do some front rolls uh, before BJJ class. And I, I got to walk a little funny across the gym because my, my inner ear is not quite as, as compensatory as it was before. My bell gets rung a little bit easier. You know, I, I was in, involved in some fisticuffs in my 20s. And I could headbutt people. I could take a shot. And honestly, it's uh, I'm not really I'm not quick. So you know, my my strategy oftentimes was to absorb damage until my opponent was a little bit tired, and then turn it around on them. Um, at age forty, I did a, a Muay Thai tournament. Uh, it's what they call a smoker tournament in the within the gym, and and I won, right? And the the guy the guy who I fought in the final in the final. Uh, was 26 years old and I was 40 years old and I was exceptionally proud of myself. I fucking hurt for days afterwards, <laughs> you know, and it's, and you know, my, my vision was a little bit funny. Everything was a little bit funny and you, you can't, although that was a good experience and I'm glad I did it. I wouldn't advise anybody over the age of 40 to say, Hey, I'm going to go into a Muay Thai school and, and I'm going to pressure test like all the time. And I don't, you know, I still do MMA classes. I still do striking classes. I'm going to go do, uh, I'm going to go to archetype boxing here in Austin next week and do a, and do a class with them, hit some mitts, hit the bag. I hit the bag all the time. I don't spar a lot because it's not a good idea. You know, we know about TBI and CT and that's especially true as we're older. You don't want to be taking a lot of headshots. So if you, if you want the advantage of the stress inoculation, uh, and feeling like you're really in a fight fighting for your life, but without the brain damage, <laughs> then, then Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is the way to go. Um, you know, I, I love the striking arts. I just think, you know, we, we, we now know that you shouldn't be sparring as much as, as a lot of us tended to. So, uh, not, not a great idea. And especially not a great idea if you're in middle age. Well, and getting ready to wrap this up, and I, that's, I love the way you, you put that out there though, because I think there are a lot of us that will be like, yeah, I want to go again. It's that human nature. If I want to challenge myself with the toughest thing, and that's where I think sometimes we need to be smart. And, and that's one of the things I've definitely learned as I've gotten a little bit more mature, a little bit older, is, you know what? I don't need to do the hardest thing. Let me learn the right way to do it and then and then get into it. Because I, I think a lot of us are like, yeah, I'm going to go try that. Let me let me start. Let me let me do a uh, l- let me do a sparring against Bruce Lee. And I don't think we need to do mm-hmm. <laughs> by any yeah. sort of imagination. So yeah. we're talking with Mike, Dr. Mike Simpson, wrapping it up. For, for if we want to get honed, if we want to make ourselves tougher, we have Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. What other little piece of advice? Like, what's something that we could do today that maybe kind of like give us that little edge as we look at uh, getting a little more mature? Yeah. Uh, you know, just you have to look at everything as progress over perfection, right? It's don't, uh, don't think you have to go in there your first week 
and uh, I'm going to, I'm going to go to the gym for a week and boom, I'm going to be in the same shape I was at age 26. I mean, that's not going to happen. Um, so be cognizant of that, you know, work smart, you know, work hard, but work smart, you know, use the benefit. As you said, we now, we, as we globally know much no, more about physiology and fitness than we did 20, you know, 20 years ago, 20 years ago, even 10 years ago. Right. And as individuals, we know way, we know way more about our bodies. Right. So we know what we can do, what we can't do or comfortable doing what we're not comfortable doing. I'm not saying only stick to the things that you're comfortable with. You do need to go outside of your comfort zone, but things that you know that you had a propensity to maybe get injured or that, uh, that caused you difficulty in the past, you need to modify or eliminate those. Like my coach knows I'm not doing Olympic lifts. It's not happening. You know, I'm finally going to, at age 55, I'm finally going to learn to, to do kip ups this year because I want to do the Murph next year. And I, the reason I didn't do it this year is I didn't know how to do kips. And I'm like, there's no way that I'm doing that many regular pull-ups in a way that fast. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, uh, yeah. Fair yeah. enough. I mean, right. That, 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 that might, kind of roll that my, eyes. my detriment. <laughs> yeah. Normally I roll my eyes with the kipping, but then sometimes with the volume, you're like, ah, that's the only way yeah. to do that. Yeah. If it's a hundred in, in my body armor, it's going to have to be kips. Yeah, so yeah. I am going to learn to kip this year, but you know what? I'm not going to, I'm not going to, if, if, if I can't learn to kip, or kipping is causing me problems. I'll still do the Murph this year, but uh, you know I'm I'm going to take a mulligan on that. You know I'll I'll modify that. There's no shame in that. Um, it, it is what it is. It's you know show up, progress over perfection, consistency over time equals results. So you can still do all the things in your life that you enjoy. You've earned. You have. You don't mind swearing on this show. No, right? no, 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 no. You fucking earn that, right? So you want that cigar and. A fucking glass of brandy on the weekend you have that shit you want a bottle of, of wine with dinner you have that sh have it with your prime rib by all means but moderation you're not going to live that way every day so uh you know just keep those things in mind have a sharp sharper eye on recovery sleep and what you're putting in your body then you know you can't treat your digestive system like a landfill like you could in your 20s so don't do it you know just just be smart about it use the wisdom of age you know you're fortunate to have it you've lived this long and you know what you're, you're it's middle age you're not done. You're maybe halfway there. So you can still challenge yourself. You don't have to check out. Um, you can still be a savage and bring it. You just going to have to ice that knee when you get home. And, uh, you know, and you, so what, you know, you are nicer sheets and you have better, you know, you have better, better pajamas. Right. I mean, yeah. that, that's the only thing that, that, that changes a little bit is, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. And I laugh because you're right. I mean, that that's one of the biggest issues. I think that one that we become more comfortable with is that no we can't treat ourselves like you said like a landfill and that is i don't know about you but just being mindful of moving every day and what i put in my body are mm -hmm. two of the things that really i found it make all the difference in how i feel and how i'm able to perform totally they, they now, totally do and then how can how can people get more information about what you're doing about about your book and then you also have su supplements out as well correct I do. So uh, I launched uh, Graybeard Performance is my brand, and it's a life and lifestyle brand that's kind of centered around my my supplement line. I have two two different supplements out now. My longevity formula, which is basically everything you need to to heal, recover, fight inflammation, and just feel better on a day to day basis. That's by far my most popular supplement. And then my energy formula. So it's a it's a good kick in the ass without jittery side effects, without a crash at the end, I'll, I'll take it before a jujitsu class. You know, I'll be going into class at six in the evening. Uh, I'll, I'll take a couple 30 minutes prior, feel great, feel focused, highly energetic all through class. I get home, I'm home by eight 30. I have a very light dinner by nine, nine 30. I'm dialing things down and getting into bed and I don't feel like that is still hanging on. So both of my supplements are, 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 in my opinion, obviously awesome. I put years of research into them. There's clinical trials behind every single thing that I put into my supplements. Uh, hopefully, my vitality formula will be coming up next in the very near future. But you can you can get those. Uh, you can get my apparel line, my jujitsu gis and rash guards, dude. If you're gonna start rolling, you gotta get uh, you gotta let me hook you up with a a gray beard performance uh, Brazilian jujitsu gi. So. You absolutely need to have one of those. And they're, they're really high quality geese as well. And it's all at graybeardperformance.com. Graybeard Performance also has its own Instagram site. And then uh, my old website is drmikesimpson.com. Um, 
I still communicate with people through that, although I don't, I don't do a whole lot. It's just kind of my publicity site. And then I have my own IG account uh, under the handle of Dr. Mike Simpson, D-R-M-I-K-E-S-I-M-P-S-O-N. Um, and Honed, my book, is available on Amazon. That's awesome. I mean, I love, I love the background. You have the military background. You have the medical background. And obviously, if you're still kicking butt at 55, you're doing something right. And that's why I, was, I love having these conversations because you have the technical skill. You have the practical experience. And for my listeners, Doc, that's the most important thing is when you combine those two, man, hopefully we got, we got some great nuggets today. So I really appreciate your time and thanks for stopping by. Yeah, brother. You know, just, you know, guys out there, if you think you're checking out, you know, I'm 55. Um, I did a double workout on Monday of this week. I did uh, a jujitsu class in the morning and I strength and conditioning in the evening. I did a strength and condition. I did double workout on Tuesday, same thing, except it was flipped. And then yesterday on Wednesday, uh, I'm a SWAT physician. So I was up at two 30 in the morning in kit serving warrants, uh, keeping up with the operators doing my thing. Uh, and I worked out today and I'm going, as soon as we get off here, I'm going to, I'm going to hide prehydrate cause I got jujitsu tonight. So you can still do all of these things, right? Only your mind is holding you back.